This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to our dental anatomy series. So this video is going to be about the maxillary canine. So here we have the permanent maxillary canine and it's going to be the last succedaneous tooth to erupt into the arch at around 11 to 12 years of age. And using the universal tooth numbering system, this would include tooth number six and 11. So I wanna start with a couple of, let's call them fast facts. So first of all, the canines are usually darker in color than the incisors and usually at least one full shade darker. If we're being technical here, we would say it typically has a lower value than its neighboring anterior natural teeth. They're located underneath the orbit, and sometimes they're called eye teeth for this reason. And since they're located at the corners of the dental arches, they're important for both aesthetics and occlusion. The canine eminence refers to this prominence on the surface of the maxillary bone, which is caused by the bulky canine root. It's also the longest tooth and it has the longest root of all the teeth. On average, that maxillary canine is going to be about three centimeters long. Having such a strong root provides excellent anchorage for orthodontic movement or supporting a bridge or partial denture. It's also the least likely tooth to be lost or extracted for periodontal or alveolar bone loss reasons. It's also the only tooth that has the potential of contacting both an anterior and posterior tooth in the ideal occlusion. And those teeth would be the mandibular canine and the mandibular first premolar. I also want to bring up the concept of golden proportion because this can come up on the board exam as well. So what is this talking about? Well, in the ideal aesthetic smile, from a frontal view, there should be this ratio that exists. Each maxillary tooth starting from the midline should be about two-thirds the size of the tooth immediately mesial to it. So in other words, in a conversational view of someone's smile, this maxillary lateral should be about two-thirds the width of the central, and the canine, what you can see of it from a conversational view, should be two-thirds the width of the lateral. So in an ideal world, you should not be able to see that distal half of the canine, and this facial ridge should dominate your view. All right, let's go to the facial aspect and talk about some of the unique features of the maxillary canine. So this is a little bit different. From a facial view now, we're going to call this a pentagon. So this is going to have the most resemblance to a pentagon. That cusp tip of the canine is going to fall in line with the long axis from the facial aspect. We'll talk about how it lines up from a side view a little bit later in the video. And you might notice, if I remove that drawing there, that the mesial cusp ridge is slightly shorter than this distal cusp ridge. Both ridges, though, make up about one-third of the overall crown height. The mesial height of contour here is at the junction of the incisal and middle thirds of the crown, and the distal height of contour is in the middle third of the crown. This is the exact same arrangement as the maxillary lateral, so hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to remember. Also from the facial aspect, you can notice this concavity that occurs right at the CEJ. It's a little bit more distinct on the distal surface than the mesial, similar to most of the teeth that we looked at so far. Also notice how the mesial surface is more pointed and sharper than the distal surface, which is much more rounded, due to what I'm gonna call the distal bulge. 
That convex distal contour makes for a fairly large gingival embrasure on that side of the tooth and also contributes to that longer distal cusp ridge relative to the mesial cusp ridge. The root apex most often points toward the distal, like most teeth that we've talked about so far. If you want to get really technical, the apex points distal about 58% of the time, it points straight about 24% of the time, and mesial about 18% of the time. You can also appreciate how big and strong this root looks. Again, it's the longest root of all teeth in the mouth. This middle facial developmental lobe dominates the crown, making for a very convex facial surface. This is useful anatomically because it sits at the corners of the mouth and turns the corner of the dental arches, leading into the posterior teeth. Again, that facial ridge is what should dominate your view if you're having a conversation with someone and looking at their smile. The crown has the same two developmental depressions that the maxillary incisors have because it also develops from three facial lobes and one lingual lobe. The developmental depressions essentially separate this crown into thirds. The distal depression is a little bit more visible and deeper than the mesial one. And just like the crown, the root is also pretty convex from the facial aspect. The lingual aspect is narrower than the facial aspect, just like we've seen with most of these teeth so far. And we will see this also with the mandibular canine in the next video. This is because the tooth tapers toward the lingual. Again, we're pitting three facial lobes against just one lingual lobe. So of course, the three facial lobes will win out. Like the other maxillary anterior teeth, it has more pronounced features on the lingual surface that we'll look at more in the next slide. It has a really large cingulum and a distinct prominent lingual ridge, both of those shown with these ovals here. The mesial marginal ridge and the distal marginal ridge are also well-defined. And there even tends to be a little bit of thickness right here below the cusp ridges on both the mesial and distal surfaces. All of these ridges together create two little triangular spaces here, which we're going to call the triangular fossa. All right, this is what I was alluding to before. This is very important. The cusp tip, as well as the root apex, fall facial to the long axis line when looking from the mesial aspect or the distal aspect. So this is exactly opposite of the last two videos when we talked about the mandibular incisors. It's also going to be opposite to the mandibular canines, which we'll talk about in the next video, where the incisal edge or the cusp tip falls lingual to the long axis. For the maxillary incisors, it fell on the long axis, and then for this tooth, they fall facial to the long axis. There's also a notable root depression, and this long, rounded, linear depression in the root is called a root flute. And remember that all facial and lingual height of contours for all anterior teeth are going to fall in the cervical third. From the distal aspect, we can notice that the distal root flute is a bit deeper than the mesial one was. And again, that CEJ or cervical line is just about one millimeter flatter than it was on the mesial aspect. And this is a trend that we've seen in all of the teeth and all of the videos so far. And I'll once again point out this concavity at the CEJ area that we talked about from the facial view. And you can really appreciate that distal bulge from this view as well. From the incisal aspect, we can notice that the facial lingual dimension is just a little bit bigger than the mesiodistal dimension. It also appears as an asymmetric diamond from this view. It's also the widest anterior tooth 
facio-lingually. Now about the pulp. So this is an important distinction from what we've seen before. Now because we have cusps in the picture instead of incisal edges, now our amount of pulp horns is going to change. So previously we always had three pulp horns with all the incisors unless we had a peg lateral where that would only have one pulp horn. Now, since we only have one cusp, we're gonna have only one pulp horn. And this tooth almost never branches into multiple roots, and so for ease of learning, we'll say that 100% of maxillary canines have one pulp canal. Although the crown had a diamond shape from the incisal view, if we cut the tooth in cross section at the middle of the root, we would see an oval shape. All right, so a summary of the maxillary canine. The incisocervical dimension is greater than the facial lingual dimension, which is greater than the mesiodistal dimension. It's the longest tooth in the entire mouth. It has a pentagonal facial view, triangular side view, diamond incisal view, and oval cross section, and it consists of four lobes, one pulp horn, and one canal. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.